And today on the Books and Music Review Show, we'll be discussing a topic that isn't explored or hasn't been explored um, that that much by uh, by the media in <clears throat> particular. Uh, that's the human rights situation in North Korea. And we'll be focusing on a book called The Aquariums of Pyongyang. It's about a group of uh, a North Korean family that was interned in a gulag for, for about a decade. And the story of one, the story of uh, the author, Kang Cho Huan, who was, who was able to escape uh, was first released and then able to escape to China and then subsequently resettle in South Korea and become an activist against the North Korean state. When you hear about North Korea, most of the time on, on the news it'll focus on a particular, particularly aggressive action that the leader has made, whether it's firing a ballistic missile into the Sea of Japan or over a Japanese island, or sinking uh, a South Korean South Korean ship, and killing hundreds of soldiers, or bombing bombing a South, uh, a South Korean island near uh, a neighboring island, or detaining Americans and Americans and Canadians who who uh, travel there. For example, Otto Wambier. Was a was an American student who went there went there as part of uh, the young I believe it's called Young Pioneers uh, tour, which takes people to it takes uh, um, takes Western tourists to supposedly uh, supposedly uh, t taboo places, and even and even though you can travel to North Korea legally, it's or could up and up and up until uh, but recently, it, the State Department advised against it for obvious reasons because they like the government takes hostages and u uses them as bar uses them as bargaining ships to advance their diplomatic agenda. So he he was uh, a young man who took down a propaganda poster, which. In North Korea, if you have a poster of Kim Jong Il or Kim Il Sung, it's 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 venerated, and touching it or defacing it or trying to steal it in this case is uh, considered sacrilegious. So he was imprisoned and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor, and mysteriously fell ill, and then his body was returned to uh, the United States. So when something like this happens, a lot it tends to get a lot of attention. But I don't think as much 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 attention is uh, given to the actual suffering of people who live in live in North Korea. Now, the author of this book was a was a Korean was part of a Korean family that lived in Japan during the nineteen. Um, that, that moved to Japan d during the 1930s. His his his, uh, his relatives, and they were part of a group called uh, Chosen Saran, which is which which is a group of Jap uh, Korean Korean expatriates who live in Japan and advocate for North Korea and the North Korean regime. So. His <clears throat> so this bi this biography autobiography describes how he came to want how he came to live first how he came to live in North Korea and then how he came to be uh, interned in a in a labor camp which in many cases for for others is a death sentence. So his grandmother and his grandfather, his grandfather was, they, they, they were polar opposites, basically. His grandmother was a diehard supporter of Kim Il-sung and the Marxist, the Korean, uh, 
or at least the Korean version of uh, the Marxist revolution within, within North Korea. While his father was a very successful entrepreneur, and he had to be persuaded, him and his uncle had to be persuaded to go to, to leave their country, the country they, they had uh, lived in for so long and been so successful in, and return and, uh, and go back to their, uh, go back to Korea, North Korea. After the war, they were told that they would, 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 would be given the chance to help rebuild North Korea, which was, the entire peninsula was devastated during the Korea, Korean War. Pyongyang was bombed to smithereens and there was a lot of uh, destruction. It was, they, they were essentially rebuilding from, from scratch. And they were, they were more or less sold a bill of good, goods they were told that they could help rebuild, especially with their, their success in another country. They could come and, re, and kind of rebuild North Korea, or build North Korea since it hadn't existed up until, up until the end of World War II where the, where the, where the peninsula was divided roughly between a, um, a communist North and um, a non-communist South, but even as they went there, even on even on the uh, ship there, they encountered people who had been who had returned from um, who had returned from from North Korea, who told them that that wasn't so, that they'd be that they were going to enter. They were given an inkling of what was to come, the, the sort of nightmarish conditions that were, were to meet them. Because in Korea, they have something called the Song Bon system, which is a ri very rigid hierarchical uh, caste system. And there are three main classes, the wavering, the uh, core class, the loyal class, people who are loyal to the regime and to the Kim dynasty, the wavering class, which includes anyone who hasn't um, includes people who the regime is suspicious of, but doesn't la label enemies explicitly. And, and the, um, the hostile class, which would include uh, anyone who was a Christian, whose family uh, was Christian, people who were uh, capitalists, and anyone who fought, fought against, fought against Kim Il-sung in North Korea during the Korean War. And the people who came, even though they were diehard supporters of North Korea, uh, with the exception of, or some of them at least, uh, they, were, they were still viewed with suspicion. And eventually they were, they were detained and taken Taken captive by the by uh, the se the secret police and sent to a labor camp called Yuduk. Now, in inside of the prison, the the gulag itself. Just to give you an idea of how uh, how terrible it was, he the author describes burying, having to bury people. Everyone who died, whether it was it, as a result of uh, mining accidents or being executed, there were, the author just uh, describes witnessing over a dozen or a dozen public ex executions. And this, you have to keep in mind, this was when he, he went there, he was, he was sent there when he was nine years old and he wasn't released until a decade later. So throughout this, span of time he had had to witness people being publicly executed uh, in one case someone who someone whose mouth was uh, filled with rocks and whose teeth were broken before um, before other people in the camp he had to endure uh, the constant search for food since these people were obviously considered um, they were obviously considered 
not, uh, you know, basically non-people, they, he, not, his, his family was not, was given some hope in the sense that they weren't, that they weren't, cons they weren't lumped into the, um, the people who were called irredeemables. They're described as irredeemables in this book, and those are people who were classified strictly as enemies and were, who had no hope of ever being released from their sentence. It, going there was, was a death sentence for them. So they had some hope, but even so, they still had to, had to bury other internees. They had to watch, witness people being executed. And death sentences were imposed for things like stealing, stealing the food of the prison guards, which you had to do in order to survive. This was, he, these are people that have had pellagra, vitamin deficiencies, um, uh, self, uh, basically, the, they suffered from famine. If you were in one of these camps, just, just like if you were in a concentration camp in Poland or um, or in uh, Germany during World War II, and the fact that not much is known about this, or not not much was known about these these concentration camps until recently, when when former inmates began to escape and write memoirs and dis and descriptions of what. What, what happens when you do anything to question the North Korean uh, regime? And it doesn't even have to be outright dissent. There isn't any place for dissent in North Korea. You can't hold a protest march or publish a scathing uh, letter. There's no internet. The only people that have access to anything resembling the internet are high-ranking uh, regime officials. And even there, it's not an actual internet. It's a self-contained uh, intranet. You can't do any sort of investigation of what, what, what the outside world is like. And you're trapped in a gigantic gulag, even if you, ha even if you are nominally free and live outside of one of these uh, labor camps. And one of, the, uh, one of the ways he escaped to freedom was when they were released, he began to listen to, he, surreptitiously he began to listen to radio broadcasts from South Korea, uh, Christian programming and uh, news programming from th things like the BBC by using a, uh, a radio. And eventually he realized that he, th the situation wasn't tenable, so he had to escape. And he, with the help of uh, his, with the help of a friend, he went, he was able to, to travel to China to bribe the uh, border guards and to go into China and eventually uh, return, uh, not return, to, to come to South Korea. And now he's, Leading, leading campaigner to liberate his his fellow countrymen to liberate everyone people who are in North Korea and to emphasize and to highlight how uh, to, to highlight the sort of dystopian nightmare that his country is. So, if you, uh, I would definitely recommend reading the book. If you have the chance, take it out from the library or purchase a copy. It's, again, it's called The Aquariums of Pyongyang, uh, 10 Years in the North Korean Gulag by uh, Kang Cho Huang and Pierre Rigolet. Um, and there are many more books like this, uh, Inside Camp 14. Um, there's also a book about the um, the new underground railroad, the system of uh, the people who are helping 
Koreans escape from North Korea. So if you have a chance, you should uh, do some research and look up this book to find out what a little bit more about North Korea and why, um, why there's more to it than missile tests and uh, hydrogen bombs. Right. Great. And the second half of our show is going to be about, you're not going to believe this. Let me make sure I can hear myself on this. Correctly. Okay. The second half of the show is going to be, we're going to give you an opportunity on uh, how to how to live to be 100 years old. So I guess I'll take the floor now and we'll give you information and helpful hints on how to live to be 100 years old. I'm an executive producer of the Books and Music Review Show and um, you can go that way, I'll go this way. <laughs> I'll come this way. So there you go. So first, I guess I should check my uh, volume of the voice. I'm not hearing this properly on this. Um, hold on and don't go anywhere. <laughs> no, not you, me. <laughs> I'm just checking. I want to check the volume of this. I'm doing okay. Okay, so we're going to tell you how to live to be 100 years old. I got this information from a wonderful magazine that's called, of all things, How to Live to be 100. And... Um, if you want to know the company, it's put out by U.S. News and World Report. It kind of tells you what science says about how to live to be 100. And you think it's all one thing, right? No, it's not. It's everything. It's spiritual. It's physical. It's mental. It's emotional. Basically, it's pretty much what God taught us at the beginning of the world. It's balance. If we think about it, and this is my opinion. We didn't get to the magazine yet, but I'll tell you when we get to that part because I'm going to read some. I think I'll have my glasses in there, too. But um, if we remember how God created the world, uh, for anybody who believes in God, um, he didn't just go, poof, the world is there, the light and the ocean and everything. He used balance. That was the first lesson that he taught us, was balance. He did a little bit at a time. Because too much of everything is not good. And a little bit at a time is perfect. Okay, so How to Live to Be 100. In this magazine, which I highly recommend, it's a special edition of U.S. And News and World Report. It's a um, special edition. It tells you what science reveals about aging. It tells you, it asks you, is your job killing you? And it tells you how to keep your brain sharp. And it tells you what experts say to keep, you know, what does it say? To do to stay young. And I have to tell you, have you ever met anybody who's 100 years old? Most people haven't. Some people have. I have met one person who was 100 years old and still working as a consultant to a company that he probably founded. He was, funny thing is he was a carpenter. And he was 100 years old and he was having a birthday party, a big reception in a big hall. And um, they were just celebrating his birthday. Now there is a, a lady who is 108 years old who lives in Staten Island. Usually here, anyone over 100, you figure they live overseas, they live in some country where you just got farm roads and countries. Staten Island must be good to live in old age. Yes, I accidentally found out that there's a lady who is 108 years old. And the way I found out was one day I decided to be a turkey crossing guard. The turkeys were crossing the road, and a friend of mine who could not help them cross the road was all upset because they had crossed the road and somebody ran over the baby turkey. It's like a teenage turkey, a little medium turkey baby. And all the other turkeys were scrambling and running across the road and the cars were still going. And how do we get from turkeys and how to live to be 100? And there's a 108-year-old woman. So here's how we get there. So I went over to talk and I was a turkey crossing guard for a while. And oh, by the way, this is the Books and Music Review Show. And um, when I'm on air, we can go from topic to topic. When we have a guest, usually we're more focused. I never take the blame of being focused. So we started out talking about the magazine. I got you to the turkeys. I'll tell you about the 108-year-old lady, and I'll tell you what the magazine says. You should go get this magazine. Tell your librarian. 
that you want to copy. What month was this? Probably an old one. Because I tend to read magazines not right when I get them right away because I'm busy. This is from 2011, and this is 2017 that I'm doing this show. But the reason I kept it, can you believe it took me that long to read the magazine? Okay, the reason I kept it is because it's all good advice. I read a lot of it, and it's all good advice. Oh, we have the age wave. You know everybody's doing like give me five and all that stuff? We got the age wave. You can do it if you're not 100. How are they doing it? I don't know. I think it's doing your own thing. Put however many fingers you want and just do the age wave. Big changes are inevitable as the first group of baby boomers approaches 65. Now that I think about it, 100 is a hell of a long time to live. Oh, you're not supposed to say the word hell because this is a clean show. But actually, you can do that. <laughs> that was unintentional. Let me give you some good advice. I'm going to go to some of the good parts. The first thing I can tell you without reading the book is, hey, quit smoking. If you smoke, quit smoking. Why? I'm going to tell you why. You've been seeing commercials where they're trying to frighten you about um, using sugar, and they've seen commercials with diabetics who are losing uh, digits and toes and fingers, really gross commercials. It's sad. And people see that, and they think sugar, 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 sugar is the culprit. But the truth is, and I'm not a doctor, so you've seen a disclaimer at the beginning of the show. I never claim to be a doctor or a medical personnel, but I am an owner of a human body, and I've been studying psychology unofficially since I was five years old. And I've seen a lot of smokers and a lot of people who have diabetes, and I've seen a lot of people get sick and get worse and get better. And there seems to be a connection between losing the digits and not necessarily the diabetes. Because I know a lot of people with diabetes who are healthy people who didn't lose anything. I sh maybe I shouldn't be talking like so flippant. I'm not trying to be flippant. I guess I'm kind of, you know, ticked off. Because media sometimes, fake news, right? The media sometimes give you wrong information. And lately what the media has been doing is been going after sugar. And I think if you see all those articles that are anti-sugar, if you look in the small print, you'll probably find out that they're put out by the artificial sweetener companies. I said probably, and this is my opinion. By the way, the part of the show where I'm on is just for entertainment purposes. So don't take any medical advice from me. So here's the thing about sugar and smoking and diabetic, diabetic people and losing limbs and fingers and stuff like that. The reason why you can have a healthy diabetic, I know that sounds silly, but you can be healthy with diabetes and probably not lose anything is because... If you know anything about smoking and what smoking does to your body is the first thing it does to your body is it takes the oxygen out of your blood. So think about this. If you're taking something and using that takes the oxygen out of your blood, what's going to happen? A lot of people get that, um, what they call peripheral neuropathy or stuff like that. They lose the, the sensitivity and the feelings and the toes. And um, I'm guessing, it's just a guess and it's just an opinion. But I'm guessing that's because the oxygen's not in the blood. Your blood goes through every part of your body. And any part of your body that is affected by your blood is going to be affected if you're taking the oxygen out of your blood. So anyway, so all I can say is I've met a lot of people with diabetes. They haven't lost any limbs. They're non-smokers. So the first thing you need to do to live to be 100 is stop smoking. Don't smoke. Don't pick up the habit. This magazine says that our DNA is not necessarily our destiny, and that makes sense because it doesn't matter what your DNA is. I mean, suppose you come from the perfect family where there's no disease, no problems, no medical problems, and you decide you're going to smoke and drink and take drugs or do this, or you're going to decide you know, to do this and that. In that case, your DNA is not your destiny. Your destiny has something to do with what you do with your body. What you, where you bring it, what you take into it, what you eat. Oh, yeah. Oh, they do mention smoking. Here's how you can kick those bad habits. There's ideas in this magazine about how to kick your bad habits, whatever your bad habit is. And if you kick your bad habits, you got a better chance to be living to be 100. Distract yourself. Set small, realistic goals. Yeah. So if you want to stop smoking or stop overeating or stop anything in particular, Probably a lot of people got a problem with, I can't do that for the rest of my life. Set a small goal. Do it just for today. 
or stop it just for today. And then tomorrow when you wake up, start all over again. Keep on keeping on. Another thing they suggest is don't get hungry or sleep deprived. There goes that balance again. You just need to be balanced in more ways than one. The magazine talks about exercise. It talks about lifestyle choices leave America in the middle age short of federal benchmarks. And it goes on to talking about a measure for good health. The next article talks about a whole town's makeover. You know what? You can always stop bad habits if you get together with somebody and you want to do it as a team. It's always easier to do it as a team, right? Don't be isolated. Go get help. So they talk about handling the hormone dilemma. They talk about getting in shape. They talk about courage. You can do it. And one of the articles in the magazine says you are what you eat. And then there's the skinny on dietary food. Dietary, dietary fats. This magazine is like packed with good information. Keep your brain sharp. And this whole chapters or two, they talk about Alzheimer's. They talk about five ways to be mindful. I think that's one of the ways you can be really healthy. Because if you think about it, if you don't worry about your whole life, and if you're not consumed by what happened yesterday, mindful, if you live in the present day, that certainly will make you healthy because you'll have less stress. And we all know that stress kills and stress harms people. So you've got page after page after page with even diagrams of the brain and scans. And they talk about meditation. So how do you live to be 100? You have ideas? You want to come on the show? Send me an email. Let me hear what you have to say. Let me hear about your passions, about your causes, about what do you want to speak about. One of the healthiest ways, one of the healthiest things you can do to yourself is, or for yourself, is to give yourself a voice. Yeah, not hold it in. Let it all out. But in the proper places and in the proper ways, express yourself. A good way to express yourself is through music, through art, through poetry, through writing, through exercise. I only got two minutes left. I have no clue what I'm talking about. I just get all excited when I get a good magazine. I get excited when it's like a healthy magazine. It tells you how to be healthy. Yeah, I'm on my way to being healthy. I think I lost like, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 pounds. I stopped counting. I need another 20, 25 pounds. So how did I do it? No, I didn't go to Weight Watchers. Yes, I ate pizza and ice cream. And no, I didn't go to any one of those programs where you have to pay to lose weight. What, are you joking me? Who'd want to pay to lose weight? I mean, it's my weight. I should be able to lose it for free, right? How'd I do it? The first thing I started doing was reading ingredients. I try not to eat anything that has more than six ingredients. So that's why I can eat ice cream and cake and pizza, as long as it's got less than six ingredients. And then the next thing I do is cut out fast food. And if you can't cut out fast food, do it day by day. Cut out food, fast food on Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays. Or when you do go to fast food, make the healthy choice. Just get the potato instead of getting this and that. I don't know. I still don't know what I'm talking about. I got a minute and 18 seconds left. All I can tell you is I wasn't in there to switch that. But still, we were talking about how to live to be 100. We had a few great guests this month, which was really, really cool. And um, hopefully we'll have some more guests and more ideas and more good shows and who knows, by the time I'm 100, maybe I'll be more focused and you'll tune into the show one day and see an actual organized show when I'm on air. Truth is, I don't like to be on air. So I think I'm going to get off there right now. You can look at the blue screen, which is actually our carpet. And I'm going to go out and switch it and let you know that, uh-oh, we forgot to say we're produced through. I have to do this before the show ends. Yeah, they give us some rules. we got to do that. Produced through the facilities of Staten Island Community Television. And then I've got to go and press the stop button. I'm glad you watched, and I hope you tune in on Saturdays at 1230. That's the time we air on Time Warner, on Spectrum. And for the time being, we're produced through the facilities. Of, oh, we do have websites. Right to the email, books, music. Well, you got that on another show. I'm just going to cut it right here.